Hello, everybody, and a very warm welcome to The Good, The Bad, and The Rugby. I'm Alex Payne. It's lovely to be back with you once again this week. This is Hask. This is Tins. How's week one been? Uh, it's, it's been good, actually. Um, can't complain. He's he's pretty good, um, the wee man. He loves his uh, Umbro Lord's Work stash uh, that I've already got him in. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, he's he's been, he's been great so far. Good. Um, You've revealed the big trail, but we'll come back to that in a bit more detail in a moment. Hoff. Don't Haskell the half. What's happening? Um, do you know what? Something fun happened, and I can't absolutely remember what it was now. So I'm just going to say business as usual. Um, that's it, really. <laughs> Something yeah. happened, and I can't remember what it happened. I've got skip. That's that's been a big day. You got a skip? Um, yeah, I've got a skip. Yeah. You having to clear out? Are you? What for? I, I just thought I needed a skip. I thought I'd reached that age where you need a skip. You like qualified right. to have a to right. have a skip. Um, are, you, are you digging something? Or, <laughs> why have you got a skip? I, I, I found, I've went up in the loft and discovered a load of stuff, and it's a bit of old stuff I need to start clearing out. How, out, how, out how much stuff have you how, got how in your How big's your loft? How big's your loft? Wait, what, you didn't think I'd done all these media appearances, all these deals, that what, I live in a shed? I know I live in a, <laughs> I live in a, a thing. Um, is, is it a few right. skeletons up there as well. <laughs> Oi. <laughs> <laughs> right, super start to this week's show. That's right up there with some of the finest content we've produced. Uh, uh, right. Big announcement. I'm very excited about this. Tits and teeth, fellas. Chests out, please. Um, we've got a new friend in the GPNR stable. Uh, the eagle-eyed amongst you will have noticed last week just a gentle dropping in of some product placement. We have got a new brand association. We are very excited to be going merch pro with the England kit manufacturer, Umbro. Um, I'm going to say this, I'm not sure whether this is natural in terms of the way that I would speak, but we've got an exclusive range of garms on the boil. <laughs> that work? That's, how, that's how new Pano speaks. That's, that's how most yeah. GBR speaks. Pano speaks. Just a little something for those who love their stash. It's a little start of a 10. If you love it, we've got some stuff for you. If it's not your thing, don't worry too much about it. Move on. Um, let's start with you. What have you got? You've already revealed yours, Tins, but you have got... I have got the Lord's work, which I like. Are you happy with that? It fits nicely. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, 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 I'm all good with that. Hoff, I've got don't Haskell the Hoff. See what you've done there. Yeah, it, it suits you well. You fill yeah. it nicely. What I wanted to put on the front of the T-shirts, I weren't, wasn't allowed to. Like, yeah. every, like everything else in life. We're I've trying got an to idea. behave. No, you don't. Yeah, we're trying to be a family show. Ellis is the loose rhino. Ben Kayser is the betonetter, and for some reason, I've ended up with. No pay, no, no gain, no. We are very excited, though. I think it's some proper top quality stash, and I hope people might want to have a little nibble. What do you well, think? I've, I've, well, I've just remembered also what happened to me. Right. Okay. Which would have been great if I'd had the stash, because you're, you're probably going to see about it in the papers either later today or tomorrow. Right. So we're, we're allowed, obviously, on today, you're allowed to go in two households, allowed to mix in an outside space. So we went down to see um, Chloe's parents. And anyway, we took Bertie down with us. We were in the garden. It was, you know, socially distanced, all that, in a boiler suit, and a biohazard suit, whatever you're supposed to be wearing. And Bertie um, decided to run out the door and run across the road onto the heat. So I walked out the door, I can't run, walked out the door, walked across the road, shouted to him, and out of nowhere, a photographer turns up, right? I whistle for Bertie, starts taking photos. Bertie takes one look at me and goes to the other side of this <laughs> giant heath, right? I am obviously trying not to look like that guy from the internet. Benton. Benton! Yeah. Right. Benton! So like, but obviously Bertie's such a posh middle class name. I'm like, <laughs> right, and I'm with him. <laughs> and he goes to the bushes, right? His pap's going, all right, James, you want to take I was like, listen, mate, this is a bit, I'm under pressure. Here. Anyway, so I then, he comes out of the bush, looks at me, and I go, come here. And he, and he runs off into another field. I end up after running. I've been running two years, <laughs> trying to keep it together, right? Running. And Chloe's taking the collar off him because she doesn't want him to be uncomfortable. I was like, it's a dog. It's a dog. He doesn't get uncomfortable as a dog. Anyway, runs to another field. He's in some sort of gang thing with these other dogs. I tried to grab him. He runs off after me. The paparazzi is taking photos of me the whole time. I decided to pick Bertie up because I can't grab him. I've got him over my head. He's licking my head, covering me my, my stuff in mud. I've walked, as I've got there, he's wriggled out. So I've half dropped him. The bloke's photographed me again. <laughs> right. I've, I've managed to get a stick in my hand. I've got a stick. I'm mesmerizing with a stick. He sat there for the stick. So it looks like I've staged it. It looks like I staged it. I then had to carry, pick up Bertie like a handbag and just walk across him off the road and throw him into the garden. I'm covered in mud, saliva. That's my day. And that guy's going to sell it to the Daily Mail online. So that's going to be in the papers by the time this podcast got out. But only if I'm wearing Don't Ask the Hoff, he may have backed off. 
But anyway, so that's what happened, and it's going to be carnage. I'm, I'm not entirely sure that's what Umbro wanted in terms of the press release of the association <laughs> between the good, the bad, and the rugby and England's kit manufacturer, but that's what they've got. And if they didn't know that's what they were signing up for, they do now. Um, we are genuinely very excited. I think there's a lot of fun that we're going to have. I think that's the main thing about this, is that there are going to be fun bits and bobs. We can have duvet covers, key rings, uh, pens, baby action grows. man dolls. What? Baby grows. You've, yeah, actually, they've already been in touch with you. Little baby grow, the, the mini lord. Um, that's for any of the super fans who want to get involved. But we do have some really good fun plans in the pipeline. We're talking about a Twickenham pitch day, which I think should be quite good fun. Maybe a little sevens tournament or something, some challenges. Um, apparently we're going to be doing a fitness session with Bristol Bears. There are going to be football challenges at West Ham. I quite like the idea of the two of you having a penalty shootout at half time at the Olympic Stadium. Yes, I'd love that. That would be Actually, really cool. Against the West Ham reserve keeper, what do you think? Well, I mean, I can't even cook yeah, a football. I'll be all over it. I mean, I'll, I could try, but it's going to be so embarrassing. But, 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 yeah, but that's the one where you score because the keeper's laughing at you as yeah. you try to run in and you'll end up scoring and I'll smash it over the bar. I'll yeah. Push, I'll waddle it. I okay, think that well, could be quite good fun. And then we're going to go and visit the AE Williams F1 team as well at some point. There is going to be a lot of fun. We've got competitions, invitations, collaborations, all sorts of things coming down the track. It's going to be a lot of fun. I hope you'll all get involved. In fact, to kick us off, I'm told we are launching a competition to win uh, a range of the awesome T-shirts. Please head to the Good, the Bad and the Rugby Instagram page to find out how to enter at Good, Bad and Rugby. The merch has landed. Get involved. Lots more plans, fun and games to be had along the way. More details in due course. Any more for any more? Should we get into the meat yeah, of it? I'm just, I'm just going to jump off with one thing, because we can. Um, I, got in, I, got, I was in touch by London Pride 7s 2021. Yeah. So there is a, as you know, we are all about promoting all rugby, and there is a London Pride 7s on the 5th of June uh, this year. Uh, yeah. And I just wanted to give a big... Good, the bad, the rugby shout out to them and hope it all goes well because we want to see as much inclusion in our sport as we possibly can. You've done extremely well. I just want to emphasise that's more the pride element rather than London pride the beer. Yes, sorry. Yeah. That is we are inclusive pride about element. drinking as well. But yeah, yeah. We, we include all types of ale, all types of people, yeah. anyone yeah. who loves rugby. Yeah. Get involved. Everyone's welcome. Good. Enough frivolity to the rugby. And on Friday night, Scotland beat France, which meant that Wales won the 2021 Six Nations. Congratulations, chapeau to them. The man who masterminded a quite remarkable turnaround in the fortunes of Welsh rugby over the last year or so is a certain Wayne Pivak. And he has unbelievably agreed to join us this evening. Wayne Pivak, thank you for coming along. It is very nice to see you. How are you on a scale of one to 10? <laughs> Yeah, a little bit tired actually. A couple of uh, couple of late nights, but um, certainly worth it in the end. Um, just very pleased that uh, you know we're able to get across the line in a strange old way. But um, for the players, you know, who'd put in so much hard work. Um, thank you for joining us, and thank you for bringing out arguably the most famous curtains in Wales. Would would that be a fair <laughs> assessment yeah. of the last forty eight hours? I think they are. I think they are. They've, uh, I've had a lot of. Uh, Comments from uh, around the globe, actually. You'd be surprised who comes out of the woodwork. Good. <laughs> where, where, what has been the most extraordinary sort of home decor feedback that you've had? There's some T-shirts going around that have been printed already in New Zealand um, to do with Wayne Pivak's curtains. But uh, yeah, I'm not too sure. I think one of the sons might be involved there. I want right. to know what was the rigging set up on the <laughs> on the the sponsor on the 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 board behind you the checkerboard behind you were you just sat on it uh, and holding it up yourself or was it down the back of the chair yeah well, it was it was uh it was supposed to be two meters wide you see which would have blocked <laughs> out the curtains perfectly but they um it came that it was made the same day i think that they dropped it off and it was only a meter wide the thing was tipping forward all the time so i had to just prop it up against the chair and so every time i moved the uh, thing was moving around <laughs> <laughs> there, there are I mean everybody loves an iconic moment you know and you win a trophy and you you dream of the, the pot lift I just wonder again sort of one to ten how you will look back on the moment that you were crowned 2021 Six Nations champions it, there was a lot going on at that yeah. moment yeah well you know you're sitting in your own lounge for a start without without your teammates your management or, or players and uh you know, you, you're watching another game of rugby on TV. It was it was surreal, you know. It's, it's, I've never had that experience before, obviously. Um, it's what you have a Super Saturday for, isn't it? S sort out a winner. But um, So from that point of view, you know, last week out in Paris, it, 
in a, in a way, it was it was quite good because um, you know we would have we had the disappointment of not winning a Grand Slam and then to turn around and try to celebrate a championship would have been an interesting exercise in itself. But certainly um, having a week to sort of wait and see what was going to be the outcome. Um, and then the way the game was played out on Friday night, you know, it, it had us going right down to the wire pretty much. So, yeah, it was a long old wait, really. What were the emotions like on the Friday? I'm just, I'm just trying to make, because well, you're completely out of your comfort zone. You can't do anything about it. Yeah, well, obviously our phones, text messaging was, was going around the group. You know, the um, the Six Nations group that we have, and there's about 60 odd people on there. And you know, I was going flat out and you um, you sort of ride every knock on and we were cheer- <laughs> cheering the Scottish, you know. And I found myself just cheering at the TV whenever a play went Scotland's way, you know. And, you know, you'd certainly when they scored, you'd work out, okay, it's now 24 points differential and, you know, they chalked off one try. And I think there was a massive moment where, you know, I just about had heart failure and that was the yellow card um, at just on half time. And then there was the line out five metres out. The French had a score then, I think, um, yeah, it would have been a, a long second half. Have you sent uh, Gregor Towns and a bottle of wine yet? <laughs> I sent I sent him a message before the game. I can assure you of that, and uh, there, there will be something going his way. Because you know there was there was a great couple of memes going around of sort of Alan Jones in a false you know false moustache and a, and a and a kilt. Did you did you <laughs> did you put, put any of the players up? Change their names. Well, there, there was some uh, some great texts, some great messaging that went out. You, you had to laugh, you know. There's some people with a great sense of humour out there. <laughs> have you managed to celebrate properly i know i know it's been a roller coaster and there's been a hell of a lot going on but in this curious world in which we all live have you managed to raise a glass two or three yeah but not as not as you would normally so we we didn't have the 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 change room scenes that you know the guys live for and uh, those memories that you take with you you know um so it was done uh, individually in, in, in homes and texting and ringing each other up on, on the Friday night after the game um, and messages of congratulations to the boys, uh, which is a bit different. And then we got together and obviously had the actual medal ceremony in our training venue at, at the Vale um, uh, here in Wales. And then uh, we had a management get together after that. Players will have to go off. Some were playing club rugby. Um, obviously, the exiled boys had, uh, couldn't come to the medal ceremony. So that was all a little bit different. But um, we haven't got together as a team, uh, which is strange. So I think everyone's done their own thing, but certainly not together as a manager and playing group together. You haven't had Alan Wynne Jones doing the splits um, okay. yet, no? No, I, I have seen the splits, but no, <laughs> not, not, not since, uh, not uh, for some time. What, what were the emotions like at the Vale? I mean, obviously there has to be satisfaction and, and great delight, but is there, a, is there a lingering itch, I suppose, in some ways, or is, is it just job done? Um, look, I guess where we had been in terms of the, the first Six Nations that I was involved with, and then we had, obviously, that was interrupted, um, you know, with COVID and, and, and the lockdown. So that, that was a strange old... Um, set of circumstances in itself and we didn't come out of lockdown very well as a group um you know we, we certainly didn't have the hard rugby in wales in, in the club sense that um you had for some of the english clubs and irish clubs and, and french who are in the in the latter stages of europe and going from that to test match rugby is obviously a lot better than what we had which was some derby matches where the coaches were rotating players and you know some of our guys came in with sort of 60 80 minutes under their belt and if you look at the english boys with Saracens boys coming out with, with no rugby, you know, I, I feel for those guys, I can see what's going on there because we went through it in the autumn, you know, if, you, if you're not match fit, match hardened, it, it makes it difficult, you know. So we had that period through the autumns, but to come out the other side of that um, and then to to perform the way we did, it, it was very satisfying. The players obviously worked really, really hard and, and they've bought into everything we've done. So, you know, just pleasing for the whole group to, to come out with, with the result. It was still a little bit annoying that we didn't get that grand slam because we uh, we desperately wanted that. And as as you boys know, they don't come along every day of the week. So that was a bit frustrating. What has the emotional roller coaster been like for you personally? Obviously, that we've we've talked about this enough on on our, on our show about how one week you can be brilliant, the next week everyone and Haskell say everyone needs to be fired, they need to get rid of everyone and. You know, you've gone from, <clears throat> from what people have said 
in a under pressure in your position to then turning it fully around to completely other side you the best thing since sliced bread and how has that been personally as a as an emotional roller coaster and how have you dealt with that yeah well i certainly expected uh, expected the the roller coaster i mean the history of the welsh coaches suggests that and throughout the interview process it was one of the one of the main topics um, in the last interview was around you know if you're successful how are you going to handle the, the Welsh public and how you're going to handle that roller coaster because it's a very much a goldfish bowl and you know rugby is the number one sport in Wales and and it's a small country so you can't really hide. Um, for me personally, it was making sure that once I got the role that um, the board signed off the, the plan that we put through to the World Cup, how we were going to navigate our way through and. And we were updating the board all the time. And when the decision was made by World Rugby in terms of the world rankings or the rankings, how they'd set up, um, sorry, the, the, the top four sides for the 2023 World Cup, once we knew that we were ranked fourth, we felt that we had a free shot um, in the autumns. So we looked, obviously, we've got a ranking system like everybody does, and we've got a few holes. And, and so it was, it was making sure that we used that wisely. And for us, it was about giving guys an opportunity for us to learn about them and for them to see if they could play at this level um, and then go away and take it, take away their work-ons. So we sort of, we felt that, you know, we were running a risk and obviously <coughs> results, it may, uh, it may cause a few results that, that we wouldn't have ordinarily wanted, but we sacrificed that to make sure that we built depth and, um, and you could see in the, in the Six Nations with the selection we went with and we were a lot more consistent in our selections, which helped things like your line out and your set plays and, so really, we we're the author of our own misfortune in the autumns, but it was signed off by the board and it's what we wanted to do. Um, and so we were never in jeopardy as far as our coaching positions were um, with, with our board. And so that was the first thing. So when you know that you can go on and do these things, you understand it's the public going to always want results in Wales. So um, you just got to live with that and, and grin and bear it. But, you know, I, I got a background of coming from the police in New Zealand and, um, you know, I've dealt with a lot worse things and a, a bit of abuse. I was going to say this. Was, this the, was it the darkest period or, or was it didn't even touch the sides? Because from the outside, having spoken to, to you know, Eddie and, and seeing what's his hat, where, where, you know, where you were, he is now. Um, was, it the, was it the hardest thing you've been through? No, not for me. N not, not a long shot. Um, as I say, it's, you know, it's, it's how you construct your contracts and, and how you, how you uh, communicate with people and, you know, having a, a chairman and a, and a CEO that you can talk to um, on a regular basis and um, you know, you're on the same page. You've got to remember those people are part of signing off the plans because, you know, everything we do costs money and we've got to get approval on a lot of things. So um, first thing you've got to do is make sure that those boys are across everything we're doing and, and they sign off on it. So that gives you a little bit of assurance, you know, um, but things can change. Uh, but as I say, we, we involve those guys in, in most things we're doing. So... And they feel part of it. There wasn't a point where you thought, I'm going to chuck this in. Well, I don't need this drama. No, because you just look at your bank balance each month, you know. And you get... <laughs> <laughs> at least you're honest. Yeah. yeah. And Has, Has, Has can definitely associate with that. <laughs> yeah, that's what I, that, and that's what my approach to life. It's good to be a fellow Kiwi. Because <laughs> if you listen to any, if you listen to any Kiwis, it's all about the love of the game. We're all very humble, but you've come in straight, and I like that. That's, that's, you're, you're, you're on team on, on board. No, yeah, no, no use beating around the bushes here. No, look, it's um, no, you know, you, you wake up every morning, and, and as a professional player, you guys will be the, exactly the same. You know, you feel privileged to do what you do, and to get paid to do your sport, it's it's something special. The coaches are no different. You know, we're just old players and. Um, look, to be still involved in the game now at my age and, and getting paid a good salary, it's, um, you know, you, you take the highs and the lows and you just got to enjoy the highs while they're there, you know. I really want to come on to your, your career in, in the police force. And I'm just fascinated by what you said about part of the interview process. Is, it, it sounds almost like they, they tested the, the thickness of your hide, as it were. I mean, when you're talking about how you're going to handle it if it goes wrong, is that as much a two-way conversation as them asking you, how you're going to kind of cope in those circumstances? Yeah, well, clearly, I think in the past, some coaches have struggled uh, dealing with it. And, and probably, you know, Welsh coaches more so than, than overseas coaches. Um, you know, coming from New Zealand, rugby's the number one sport there as well. And, and you know, where I came from, Auckland, whether or not you have a, um, a the, the strongest side at the time, because it's Auckland, you're expected to win all the time. So there's always pressure every time 
your team took the field to win. So you understand what that's like. So it's no different here now with Wales. Um, so I'm used to that side of it. But, you know, when, when you have to go into people's homes and tell them that someone's passed away, you know, dealing with somebody over a rugby result is probably a lot easier than... And some of the, some of the things that you get involved with in, it, in, in the interviewing of, of some pretty bad people out there, you know, um, it, it makes it a lot easier. Well, for me personally... Uh, I don't know, talking to Steve Hansen and, and Mike Cron, the other boys that I was in the police with, you know, it's, it does give you, uh, you know, you're used to dealing with people from all sorts of different backgrounds, you know, from from your, your, the likes of the guys you're going to have on your boards, you know, the company directors and, and guys have done very, very well. And then you, you've got to deal with fellas that um, probably didn't do that well at school, you know, and have been in trouble a bit. Um, and getting them to get, get on the same page as you and so you can get the job done is, you know, you, it makes, I think, the, the level of communication and that sort of thing a lot easier. Um, and I find uh, that, that that's probably a strength. I was just going to quickly ask, because I'm fascinated in, in the framework that you personally therefore operate in. And if naught is sack him, he's got to go now, and 100 is he's the greatest thing, let's make him the King of Wales. Where, Wayne, do you keep your sort of, your frame? Are, are you, are you, do, you, do you just sit at 50% all the time or do you get down to sort of 40% and up to 60%? Where do you operate on that emotional scale when things are going not as well as you want and going where you need them to, to be? Yeah, uh, look, I do a lot of, um, I have a lot of conversations with a lot of people on a regular basis in and around our group so that, you know, hopefully, you know, you're on top of most things. Um, and it's relationship, relationships that you build over time. And I guess having the five years, I think it was, at the Scarlets and having a, a decent representation from the Scarlets in the Welsh team, you know, boys all talk, don't they? And they all ask questions. They all want to know what, what people are like. And so I think having those relationships with the Ken Owens, uh, the Jonathan Davies, those sorts of people who are the senior players on the Welsh side, it certainly helped. Um, but look, yeah, there's, there's some things that you have to do. Um, you know, I had a pretty tough conversation with Byron Hayward, who was my defence coach for five years. We won a championship together, did well in Europe. Um, but, you know, for what we needed right now, it, it just wasn't working in terms of what we're delivering in terms of our defence. So, you know, that, that was a pretty tough conversation. But because of the relationship, we we're able to say, uh, you know, it, it's, we've got to do what's best for the team. It's as simple as that. And, you um, Credit to Byron, you know, he handled that really, really well. Um, it's getting guys like Alan Wynne-Jones, you know, making sure that, you know, he's across most things that we're doing. Um, so I think, you know, when you see a guy like Alan Wynne and you see what he's doing on the field, uh, and then when you see him in the training um, area, he's still, you know, the guy that gets first into the scrums, the first to the line out, he's just, he's so driven. I mean, you get a guy like that on side and, and he's got a new lease of life. It's sort of, yeah, you, you, it's the communication is huge. It's, it's man managers is ninety percent of what I do. Um, so yeah, you can go from from sort of one speed to the next quite quickly. Um, from having a tough conversation with a fellow coach to um, you know picking a nineteen year old. Mm. Just, when you so when, you've obviously got a great communication with the, the CEO and the board above you. When you take on a job like Welsh Rugby that, and everyone throws out legacy of, of you know, um, Gatland and, and what's gone before you, when you're taking over from that legacy of someone who's been there for eight, ten years, did you always know it was going to be tough because you are having to completely shift mindsets from how you, you're – philosophies that separate from from Gatland say did you know that was going to be tough and is that was that part of the process of you going through it with the board about where you're going and how you're going to get there yeah and, and it, I had to make sure they all understood that Warren had done a fantastic job obviously won a lot of uh, Grand Slams um, championships um, but I felt that what hadn't been done by that regime was um, do well on a consistent basis against southern hemisphere sides and to win a World Cup, you've got to be able to, um, at some stage in the tournament, knock over a pretty good Southern Hemisphere side or two, as well as, you know, deal with um, our Northern Hemisphere neighbours. So, you know, it was how do we do that? And I think um, it's, it's probably proven that you've got to score some points in the modern game, as well as defend um, really, really well. So what we wanted to do was just add to, the, to what was already a very good team 
Um, but as it, do, as it was with the Scarlets, it took two or three seasons before we really nailed our attack. Uh, it, it takes a while if you've played a certain way for a long period of time and, and you've got to improve skill sets. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was getting the messaging across and making sure everybody understood what we we're trying to do and achieve uh, and buy into it. So for me, it's about, yeah, Warren had a, a, left a great legacy, but it was being focused on how, how can we add to what he's done to try and win a World Cup. And it's as simple as that, really. So for us, it was, we've got to score more tries. Uh, we've got to be more creative in terms of what we do with the ball. And that's what we've done behind the scenes. And I think we started to see that in the latter part of the competition. I can already see the Western Mail writing the headline, we're going to win the World Cup. So um, <laughs> I, I hope you're all right with the pressure that's going to come. Sorry, Hask. No, I was going to say, obviously, when you're top of the tree and you're prioritising kind of, you know, the, 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 the mental state of the team, and getting the messages across and putting the kind of your standard down and winning people over, it can be quite lonely as well up there. Do you, do you have people that you, you turn to and communicate, anyone that you really bounce ideas off? Because, you know, when you're dictating everything, sometimes it's nice to turn to someone without a bit of judgment and go, Jesus, this isn't, you know, whatever, this is going well, this isn't going well, what do I do? Do you have anyone like that? Yeah, we're very lucky, um, or, or I'm very lucky in that um, you'll notice that the team I've put around me in terms of, um, you know, team manager um, Nugget, you know, Martin Williams, 100 tests. Um, you know, you've got Gethin Jenkins, Mel on there with 129 tests, whatever it is, Stephen Jones, 104, um, British Lions. Uh, so, you know, that they have a lot of um, uh, interesting information when it comes to, you know, the psyche of some of these boys and, and what they're going through. Um, because you've got to remember, I haven't played test match rugby, you know. So uh, for me, um, those guys have been invaluable. Um, and one which um, I've got to mention is Neil Jenkins, who's obviously been part of both regimes now. Um, you know, and we looked at Alan Wynn coming back, no club rugby, Ken Owens, maybe one game, uh, half a game or something. Um, Josh Navidi, no rugby. Um, Liam Williams, very little rugby. Jonathan Davies, very little rugby, but... You know, the experiences Jenks has had with those guys over a number of years is that quality world-class players uh, sometimes can get back with a few training runs and, and so long as they're hitting certain numbers. And they know their bodies better than anyone. So, again, that was reassuring. And then it's just come, I have a lot of individual conversations with players, you know. Um, and I think um, they've, they've enjoyed the fact that there's a lot of communication. Um, and that's probably, if anything, maybe I communicate too much sometimes. It's something that I've got to keep in check. You mentioned about the, um, the you having not played Test rugby. Is that does it feel a bit like for you when you know they pick presidents who haven't served in like the you know the the armed forces and people look down their nose at it? Do you do you, do you think it's a, a something you have to worry about? You find you're judged a bit more on that, or does it not? Does it not matter? I'm interested because I'd never thought of it like that because you're either a good coach or not. But for some of these old heads, people get a bit funny about that kind of thing. Yeah, look, I think you've got to prove yourself. I think, you know, when you come into any new environment, there are always going to be one or two that are, that are going to test you out. Um, but I, I think, you know, I did a lot of work prior to coming into the first camp um, meetings, um, you know, Alan Wynn having coffees and sitting down and, and explaining the way we wanted to play the game and trying to get them excited about and getting a new lease of life. Um, and I think the, the, the work, the mileage that went in early on with individuals, and then when they come together as a group and start chatting. Um, and I think also having a guy like Stephen Jones, who's well-respected, obviously, in, in, in all parts of the world, but certainly in Wales is a bit of a hero, um, and the Martin Williams, these sorts of blokes, when they're talking around what we'd achieved at the Scarlets and how we went about it, um, and also what you've done in, in other competitions. So I think... It's important, again, just to make sure that you get the key people on side early. Can I ask you just, a, I suppose, a couple of questions just about the campaign as a whole? And, I mean, everyone knows the Six Nations is, is so, it's so important to get momentum building. Did, did you come into this tournament in 2021 thinking we are quietly under the radar, but we're exactly where we want to be? Or was it just a case of let's, let's win the first game and see? Did, did, did you have expectations of, of silverware or were you just fascinated to see how it would come together. Yeah, well, I think um, every, every team at test level that's, apart from Italy in this competition, probably believes, or well, this season, believe that they could win the competition. Uh, look, we, we, we knew the work we'd done behind the scenes. We knew that we'd selected a different team from the one in the Autumn Series. And everyone was banging on about the Autumn Series and writing us off. We were sitting there qu 
quite comfortable in the, in the fact that we knew we were a different team. We had another, um, you know, few weeks together in terms of the, the squad that we had picked. We'd obviously been getting around club rugby behind the scenes and talking to people and, um, you know, everyone had got their work-ons going away from the last campaign and, and knew exactly the skill sets that we're working on. Um, and once, once we got into camp, we had a couple of really good weeks before the Irish game. Um, so we went in there quietly confident, certainly not overconfident, um, but we knew how important those first two games were and we had a six-day turnaround and travelling away for the, for the Scotland game. And that, for us, was, was going to be the big challenge. We felt if we could get those two games out of the way, you know, an England-Wales game pretty much takes care of itself. Certainly, that's my experience being with the Welsh boys. You know, they'll always get up for that game. Um, and so we had, a, we had a, a week off, too, to prepare for that one. So that was always going to be the big one. If we could get through that, then it, it was just going to come down to France. So... We had some luck, obviously, at the start of the competition, um, but we felt in both games we were in a reasonable space when those red cards came. Um, and as you've seen in, in this competition, you lose a red card doesn't mean to say you... You lose a guy to a red card doesn't mean to say you lose a match necessarily. Mm. Did, did you really notice a, a difference with the, uh, the England week? I'm always interested because, you know, we, we've always we talked about it before, and, and I think, um, you know, Warren Gatton talked about it, Sean Edwards talked about it before, that, you know, <laughs> if Wales were to beat England, Obviously, you guys were in a much better position than we were. All is kind of forgiven. Did you actually notice like a tangible thing of like, boy, suddenly just a couple of inches taller, training slightly more aggressive? Did, did you notice that? Or is it all a bit of just rhetoric? No, 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 no. It, it, it takes another level. It goes up another <laughs> notch. <laughs> Believe you me. Right. Yeah, but, I mean, it's just so much history, isn't there? And, um, and the boys talk about it openly. And, and people on the street will turn around and say to you, we don't really care what happens so long as you beat England, you know, all's <laughs> forgiven. And, it, and it's, you know, it's, it's like that. And when you get down to the tribalism and club rugby in Wales, when I was coaching the Scarlets, it didn't matter what you did all season, so long as you beat the Ospreys, you know. And so they're very, very much like that when it comes to, to England, Wales. So, yeah, you, you know, and, and you see Alan Wynn, you know, like he's, he's a, a great barometer. Like he, he'll, he winds guys up in the early part of the week. Um, and he's very experienced at doing it, you know. And um, yeah, that, that particular week, as each day went on, it just got ramped up more and more. And we, we had to say very little in the latter part of the week because we could see that the guys were in pretty good, pretty good space, you know. Are you more disappointed about not getting to celebrate as a team or not having a full stadium to see you guys beat the... Uh... To beat us, because I imagine it'd be 50 50. And I know you haven't experienced both yet, but I can tell you, having been there and lost to Wales, mate, they, people talk about the crowd and the noise, and you, you don't appreciate it. There against Wales, your Wales are five points up, you're five minutes from the Welsh line. It's like someone's pushing on your head. I've never experienced anything like it to, to date. Yeah, look, it, it's a pretty special place. Um... And I've only had um, three experiences with the crowd there, the Barbars, I think Italy and, and France. Um, but, yeah, I, I can... We were sort of talking about it and saying, and the, the boys that have been there and done it before were saying, you know, like, the crowd would have absolutely gone off with Corey Hill's try at the end. We'd won the game at that stage. You know, it's the last play of the game. But the fact that they got a try, got a bonus point, got 40 points... That the place would, would have gone crazy. And, of course, you know what would have happened in the streets later on. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, look, to, to missing out on the crowds has been, has been disappointing. But you guys know when you win a championship, the, the change room is the place that everyone wants to be, you know. <laughs> and the, the scenes that go on there, are, it's what you do all the hard work for. And at that point, you're not worrying about bonuses and money. You, it's, it's just to win a championship. Did you, you discover know. you had friends that you didn't know you had when you won the when you won the Six Nations? Because <laughs> because I, I bet you I bet you I bet you went a lot of friends went missing when it was bad times. But did you gain a few? You were like Christ. I don't think I've heard from you for a while. Who are you? Yeah, hundred percent right there. <laughs> yeah, there was um, there was um, yeah. I don't know how some people get your number. You know, it's supposed to be a a, a private number, but uh, yeah, they do manage to get it from all over the place. It, they still have it in the in like the local book. They have a directory in Wales. You can't get out of it. It's so, such a key role. Um, I was going to say, you talked about your attack, and that that was really interesting to me because I would still would you still say there's still work ons for the attack outside of the the twenty two, but inside the opposition twenty two, you must have walked away unbelievably happy with how many times you went in there and came away with points. It was it was astounding for me. Yeah, it was one of the things that came out of. Um 
it came out of the uh, autumns was we, we had a lot more focus sort of five to 10 metres out from the goal line. We did a bit more work on it and we, we've played around with uh, what we do with the ball carrier and who supports them and before contact, that sort of thing. And, and we scored a few tries in that area, which we hadn't done previously. So that was pleasing. Um, <clears throat> but you're right. We, we had a disconnect. We, we were in previous campaigns, we, we were attacking quite well from, you know, counter-attacking around our own 10 metre line. Uh, turnover ball, that sort of thing. But once we got into the 22, the play slowed down. We, we didn't really have a go-to. So we spent a lot more time in training in and around the opposition 22 um, with a view of we come away with some points. So we build pressure so we can get three points um, by multiple phases and, and obviously being very accurate at what we do at the breakdown. Speed of ball at the breakdown is everything for us um, with what we're trying to do with the attack. So, uh, yeah, we, we place a lot of emphasis on that. The question I'd love to ask you as well, I don't know whether you've sort of done anything on this, but we were talking actually last week, and I know it's not as simple as 3 million people in Wales and 55 million people in England, but Wales, particularly in the last 15, 20 years, have been unbelievably good at maximising the sum of their parts. I think even Brian O'Driscoll was saying this week that, that everyone is envious of how Wales have achieved what they've achieved with what they've got. I mean, if you could bottle that, you could sell it alongside the T-shirts of, of Wayne's curtains and you'd be making a lot of money. <laughs> but I just wonder whether having coached with the Scarlets and now in your role, is there anything in that? I mean, can, can you work out why Wales are so good at pulling together as one and, and, and delivering what they deliver? Yeah, because the, the question I always get asked is, how did Warren do it now? How have you done it with, on the back of your, your club's performances? Yeah because they haven't always been um, at the forefront. So, um, you know, I, I talk to the guys a lot around the jersey, the three feathers, and they're just so passionate about it. There's, um, they've grown up as kids, uh, very similar to what we did in New Zealand. You know, I used to get taken to Eden Park as a kid every week, every week, you know. You get your old man to take you out of school, sneak you out of school, so you go to a Ramsley Shield game in the middle of the week. So rugby was, was everything, you know growing up um, and obviously back in those days you didn't have all the bloody phones and all the other bits and bobs to to sort of use up your time but the, and the Welsh boys it sounds like you know their upbringings um, and around rugby clubs and that sort of thing are very very similar um, and so you just live and breathe it you know it's what else do you want to do but play rugby and then you know to, to be able to pull a jersey on and represent your country that's mad about it um, it's something special I guess. Were you surprised about how talented the, the players were? I know you obviously had the, the exposure at Scarlet, but to see them all together, did it surprise you or, or did you expect it? Because when I was on the Lions tour with the, with the Welsh, I was blown away by how good they were. Um, and actually, even, even I thought, you know, the amazing success they had is they're so talented. I think they could have done e even more. And it, it, was, it was kind of quite surprising to me, really. Not, not out of an arrogant point of view, just I'd never seen them up close. I'd never worked with them. And I thought they were, they were um, incredibly talented. Yeah, look, I think um, it's just understanding how you want to play the game, the skill sets that are required, and then making sure that, you know, we're working on that as a, as a country. So what we're trying to do here is make sure that the basic skills that we're working on are continuing in with the clubs. So uh, this week, you know, I've been to two clubs already and I've got two more to go to, and it's just sharing just a few little work-ons that the boys have to have and making sure that, you know, Constantly, they're working on certain skills. Um, and for us, you know, catch and pass under pressure is huge because we want to be able to move ball. We've got some exciting guys out wide and we need to get them into the game. Um, and speed of ball is the key with the, with the defences the way they are. If, if, you know, if you don't get speed of ball, it's, it's very, very difficult. I want to come on to you, to you as a, and in the police force in just a moment. I just, I, and I know it's a scored effort. I do just want to ask you a couple of questions on particular individuals. Lewis Rees Samet, and you've talked about picking a 19 year old kid. Um, the, the real deal, or just don't put any pressure on, give him time, or, or so, believe the hype? So, believe the hype. He, he has had an amazing transformation from the autumns to the Six Nations. He, he was unselectable in the, uh, in the autumns. People were saying, or, or in the first Six Nations, sorry, we, we should have played him in the, in the first Six Nations. Um, but he couldn't repeat speed. He, he was so unfit. Uh, he, he couldn't play at this level of the game. He had some work-ons defensively and under the high ball, and the guys just worked so hard, um, and I wasn't sure that he would, but he certainly has, and he's a terrific um, guy to have on your side 
to see the way he's worked. Um, yeah, and it, he was probably, who knows, what should we say? He, he was with a, was at Gloucester with a, a bit of a superstar there for a while, and he's doing a bit of nightclubbing and that sort of thing. And it's probably, <laughs> now that those two aren't together anymore, I think he's, he, he's working a lot harder, let's put it that way. I don't know who you could be talking about, but yeah. um, it's good to know he's been coached in all the right areas of his life. Um, <laughs> and the other one is, is the old war horse, Alan Wynn, I mean, he's, he's totemic. And even on this side of the bridge, there is so much respect for him. But having worked with him, and I know you've obviously, you're talking about having cups of coffee and getting him on side, but for all that you've done in the game, is he up there with the very best standard drivers that you've worked with? Yes, yes, driving standards, without a doubt. Um, and he leads by example. Uh, I, I just don't know where he gets the energy from. Every single training session, he comes out of the... Uh, the marquee on the side of the ground there at the Vale, and, and he, he he's he's, oh, he's just like a bloody twelve year old running around, you know. He, he seriously has a huge amount of energy, um, and and I think he's just got a new lease of life. Uh, you know, I have no doubt at all he can go to the World Cup. Absolutely no doubt from what I'm seeing, unless he goes off a cliff. And I know you know it happens to everybody at some stage, the yard of pace, what have you. But um, at the moment, he's showing no signs. I think. The challenge for us and the challenge for his club is to make sure that he doesn't get overused. Um, you know, he's having that eight weeks off was probably a saviour for him. And to come straight in off the back of no club rugby and play the way he did, I think he's still, you can see that he's still got a lot of value for our side. Were you surprised about how quickly he um, he adapted to, to a new style of play? Because I remember seeing seeing the stats, obviously, from the, I think it was the first Six Nations, obviously, most passes, most everything, and, and most offloads. And to see Alwyn Jones, who is, a, like, you know, an incredible player, but to see him going through tackle, out the back door, offloading, and that, he, you know, he's had that in his locker in the past, but not to the same thing. You know, they say uh, old dog, new tricks. Are you surprised at how well he's adapted as well as setting the standards? No, well, I, was, I was looking at how he was getting used before, and... and, and... You know, L's, uh, you know, he, he was, a lot of the ball was slow ball and, he, and he, he's a big guy and he's taking the ball, getting two defenders on him at the same time. And, you know, he's getting bashed around. And we, we thought, if we're going to get him through to the World Cup and the way we want to play the game and our, our sort of set up and, and attack from counter-attacks and that sort of thing, we can position the boys where we want them. And it's an economical style and that we're not all going following the ball. And so we felt that with a skill set, we can put him in a wider channel and um, in certain parts of the game. So he really enjoyed that challenge um, and he was really up for it. And at trainings, he's doing a lot of work on his offloading. And you saw, I think it was against Ireland in the first Six Nations um, mm. over in over in Ireland. He got the ball, he got the ball away, and, and we scored a try. So you know, he's um, he's looking forward to more of that. I think. Lion skipper. Well, why not? Why not? Um, that'll be Warren's call. Um, uh, Warren with the Welshman as a captain, probably the odds on. I'm not sure. Clever. It's, it's not an English bloke, is it? No. <laughs> Certainly isn't going to be you, Hask. We can no. all agree with that. Well, I was thinking if, if I had Wayne coaching me, I might still be playing because Alan and Joe's looking younger and I can't, I can't walk. I don't really know what the magic is. If, you, if there's something you're giving them or, or a little bit of, bit of magic, Wayne, send it down my way, mate. I, need no, it. I, I think there's an addition there for, for you, Hask, in terms of joining Nugget as the, as the chief chat, chief fun police. No, you know, I, I, think, think, I think Wales are going really quite well without <laughs> getting Hask anywhere near. We could, we could derail. Controls. We could derail this. We could derail <laughs> yeah, it. the inside out. <laughs> Um, oh, Wayne, can I come on to you? And I read, um, reread just the, uh, one of the best articles I've ever written by um, Graham Simmons, who was my mentor at Sky and just the most fabulous, fabulous journalist. And I know that you spent a bit of time with him back in the Scarlet's days. I just want to reread you one of his qu uh, quotes that you gave him. Oh, you can smell a crook. I've been off the force for years and I was still driving around Auckland thinking, hey, there's something going on over there. Even now I can walk into a bar or a club and scan the room in five seconds and tell you where the trouble's going to start. When you talk about smelling crooks, I know Hask is extremely <laughs> pleased we're on a Zoom tonight because <laughs> there's a definite odour around him. It's a brilliant quote, though. Um, when, you, when you look back now at your, your career in the sort of police force, does it feel like yesterday? I ask this a lot. Does it feel like yesterday or does the cop still live strong in you? Well, dealing with rugby team is like uh, it's like the old job a lot of the time. To be honest, <laughs> you know, like, especially on a Tuesday, the boys avoid me like the plague. You know, because generally you're going to name the squad on a Tuesday. No one wants to get that eye contact, or that little, come over and have a little conversation. You know, 
Um, <laughs> Your collar felt. Has yeah, talked no. about that all the time. Avoid yeah. the coaches. They can't drop you. <laughs> in the old job, I, did, I had a few years and in, in, in quite often I'd be in jeans and a T-shirt and that sort of thing. And um, so it wasn't sort of, you know, just driving around in a marked police car and a uniform. So, um, and you... Because you, you were criminal investigation unit, is that right? Yeah, so we, we would sometimes be in uniform, sometimes depending on what we were so, trying to solve or, you know, it, it could be anything from a homicide to, uh, to a robbery, to a rape, whatever. Um, and so there's a lot of serious crime. And, and so, you know, you had a little bit of latitude, to be quite honest. So you could have to think outside the box. Um, and so, uh, yeah, the boys, the boys, when they think they can get away with something, generally speaking, we've done it or, or been there or seen it, you know. So um, it does help from time to time. And, you know, you can have a bit of a laugh with it too because there's some pretty funny stories over the years. Remind me not to invite you to any of my team socials. <laughs> <laughs> How much of those those days do you do you bring forward to the coaching? Because you said you're basically um, a, a people person. It's all about managing relationship. Is that all built on what you... You were you used to do in the police force. Yeah, well, I think yeah, you, you get a, you get a um, you know you have to elicit information from people who don't want to give it to you, and, and there's a skill in that in in, in terms of interviewing. Um, and really, it's, it's what I found over the years it's building trust with people. And rugby players are no different. You know, uh, if I don't have a relationship with them, there's no trust there. Sometimes it's pretty hard to get on the, on the same page. Um, I, I just think that it's it, it's really helped me. And I know um, when I look at Shag, Steve Hanson, Mike Cron, guys like that, um, and there's plenty of other guys that in the police in New Zealand that have gone on and done um, some pretty good things in rugby. Um, I, I think it does definitely help, you know. Was Hanson your assistant in the police? Say again? Was, he your, was Steve Hanson your assistant in the police? Yeah, so um, I, I had a serious knee injury and stopped playing at about 27, 28, and so I got straight into coaching. Um, and I was coaching the New Zealand police team and Steve uh, came on board as an assistant um, and Mike Cron was the other selector. So it was the three of us. Uh, it was, it's gone, it was it's gone all right since then. I, I, I thought he might have been your assistant as in the two of you were in a car. I was, I was suddenly seeing sort of like <laughs> massive sideburns and flares and, and leaping yeah. over fences. But that wasn't the reality. Now, Steve wouldn't be leaping over too many feet. To <laughs> Going route one. Would you be a who was good cop, bad cop? That's what I was wondering if you were using yeah. anyone's heads to open doors and stuff like that. <laughs> I, you know, we can't tell too many stories, can we? <laughs> not, not if you want to keep your job not, anymore. Well, yeah, actually, yeah. Not, you've won a Six Nations, so you can do what you you're want. Safe now, you're safe now. window. Was um, window. Amazing. But do you, I mean, I can't imagine your, your, your bank manager's missing it, but. But do you miss those days? I mean, it was was it was it as exciting as it sort of sounds? Yeah, look, it was a different era. Um, I wouldn't do that job anymore. <laughs> Certainly, I, I think we got out uh, when we did because the rules started to change. You know, there was um, cameras going everywhere, and you know, back in the day, um, you know, it was the rule of the jungle, the law of the jungle, really. Um, and it was just it was a different style of policing. Um, but there were less people in prisons and more people behaved themselves. Yeah. I wondered, you, you said you can spot spot criminals. Can you spot um, brown noses? Because you mentioned Ken Owens, and Ken Owens <laughs> is already earmarked himself on the board of the WRU. We call him Chairman Ken. You must have seen him come in a mile off. Was he bringing you apples, cups of tea? <laughs> well, I made him captain, didn't I, of the Scarlets first week I got there. So, um, no, Ken, Ken's, he's, he's a fantastic bloke, the sheriff. Yeah. He's um, he's just really upset because of COVID. He's uh, he's done up a nice bar at his place. Um, you'll have to get down there at some stage. It's apparently very good. I haven't, I haven't Blazers only, is it? <laughs> yeah, that's the problem. No, if Chairman no. Ken, he, well, you know he's on the board at the Scarlets now. That's what I mean. That's what I mean. He's everywhere. Yeah. If you if you yeah. go to a bar, it'll just be a lot of old men, way older than he is, standing <laughs> there. You'll be like, Ken, where's your actual friends? He's like, no, these are all my friends, bud. Like, no, they're not. They're all people in positions of power. Give it a rest. <laughs> I'm glad you spotted it though. So you, you're obviously more sharp. You can spot the criminals and the brown noses. That's good to know. I'd be screwed then. I'm not sure what I am. I'm a bit of both. Yeah. Well, the uh, the ropes told me a few stories actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't. You must know not to believe anything that comes out the ropes, man. Oh god. I forgot the ropes still on the firm. Uh, yeah, I should have spoken to you off air at wait, in case you said anything. Yeah. He, he is he is still uh, at an airport in Paris, still making his way home to his uh, <laughs> to his wife, and, and uh, he's going to meet his uh, new board, new job for the second time, I think. Yeah. 
Wow, God! It, all, it, all the good stories. Just, just wait. We just sorry. I'm really interested about that. You talk about the rope because obviously, you know, you this like is you Bobby said, Stridgen for those who Stridgen, haven't yeah, necessarily Stridgen. followed the, the story from the sorry. start. And he's head of S&C and stuff. And obviously, I know you've, you know, you've retained some, surrounded yourself with those players. Was he someone that you heard about as kind of almost a, like a folk hero to keep on board? Because he's fantastic as what he does as a job. He's an unbelievable motivator. And it seems like you've kept certain elements, which mean that, yes, it might be a, a new management, but there's still that kind of same vibe. Yeah, well, I, um, I've got a great relationship with a, a young second row I used to coach, Ali Williams who obviously went to um, Toulon. And uh, so I met Bobby through Ali a few years ago and uh, figured out um, when the team bus was held up for the Toulon boys because Bobby and Ali were still with me in the bar that um, he's probably a good chap. He, uh, <laughs> he liked a quiet one. And um, but he was, as you know, he's, he's just such a great motivator of people. And he's, he's a great guy to have around. He lifts the mood of the place and, you know, he, you're not always up, are you? Sometimes it's, it's, you have some bad moments and uh, like through our autumn, he was fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Um, top man. Does it, does it, so, so you were saying that obviously when the pressure's coming on, you know, it's sometimes hard to go to the well. Someone like Bobby just rolling in and, and making sure that training's going well, warm-ups are going well. He can change the whole dynamic and start, keep the lads focused on what they're enjoying. Yeah, and he has that ability to flick a switch, doesn't he? He's a very bright guy and you know, um, he does a fantastic job and he's loved by everyone, management and the players and, you know, um, and he's just such a character. And I think, um, you know, no matter what level of the game you're at, you've got to have those characters. It, it can't be robotic. It can't be a sterile environment. And he um, he's certainly worth his weight in gold. And when I got the job, um, you know, he was one of the first people that we made sure was watertight in terms of the contract because I felt that uh, he'd get snapped up um, anywhere else as, as quick as as quick as anything if we didn't have after him. Have you seen the rope? Yes, I have. Oh, it's unbelievable, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> uh, more, more, more than once. Yeah, I, that's part of parcel. If you employ Bobby, you're definitely going to see it more than yeah. once. It's healed. It's healed. More it's, injury. Yeah. Right? If I had it on a day-to-day -day basis, I wouldn't have a problem with my ankle, but I can't get access to him. Yeah. <laughs> Char charge is too much now. Just on, but just on someone like Bobby, and, and particularly because he's been with the, the squad for such a long time, do you challenge him to freshen the content, the tone, the way that he does, he communicates, or does he kind of take that on himself? How, how important is it to keep the content fresh? Oh, it's very important. Look, he, he, he understands how we want to play the game. So he knows what's required in terms of the, the levels of conditioning. Um, he, he's very, very good at, uh, obviously we've got GPS, we've got everything that opens and shuts, but Bobby will just watch a training session. I use my gut a lot and we, we talk at the end of the session, it's just a quick look. He gives a nod, we're good, we're fine with that. Or he might just want another five minutes of uh, conditioning games or something at the end of a training session. But he's um, very much bought into the fact that if we can do our trainings a certain way, we can be working on our skill sets at the same time as getting the conditioning and so uh, we've sort of mixed it up a bit and, um, you know, he, he's, he's just been spot on with everything he's done. He's, he's the best in the business from the people I've dealt with. He's, uh, he's second in the man. The, the other equation I'd love to know is that for all the values, culture, sports science, etc., where do you find the balance between that and the power of, of a good beer? Because it, it, there's, there's definitely sort of old school in, in the, and I, I know from, your success with the Scots, the players absolutely loved that run of success. I just wonder how you equate the two. Oh, look, you've got to look at it and say what's changed over the years. What, why do people play rugby? And I, I believe it's the same. You know, you, it's a, a contact sport, so you you actually like hitting people. You you like being hit. It, it sounds a bit silly, but it's a barbaric sport at times, isn't it? And and the size of the collisions now. So it takes a certain person to want to play the game. For a start, and, and I always find that uh, camaraderie, you know, um, you know, it's not an individual sport like tennis or golf. Um, boys like to be with each other; they like each other, form those relationships, those bonds that they have. And look, we, when you when you go and ask people to do things that if they did it in the street, they get arrested and go to court on the Monday, um, you got to reward the hard work and success. And I'm a great believer in that. You know, you celebrate every success. Um, but we don't celebrate losses. We'll have a couple of quiet beers together, glass of wine, whatever it is, in the, in the team room. But we'll always have a, a, a drink together. And at one, it's a sombre moment if we've lost. 
Um, but that's where the, 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 the following result starts. Mm. Um, you know, we don't go to bed and just sort of disperse. So I think it's really, really important and it's something that we should never lose in the game. Yeah, right time, right place. I just, the other thing I was going to ask you is how essential it was those years with the Scarlets and, and the success that you enjoyed and how much that prepared you for this job. I mean, would, would you slightly worry about taking the Wales job without having integrated yourself into Wales and, and loving it as you do? in an environment like the Scarlets? Yeah, I think it'd be really tough. I think um, for me personally, it's, it, it, it's helped immensely. One, as I said earlier, you know, a lot of the players when I walked into the, the camp for the first time, I'd coach. So, uh, and, and they all, they all talk to each other. So um, yeah, learning about the players, uh, sort of what makes them tick, uh, why they play the game, um, understanding the, the Welsh psychology um, and being able to re relate to that as a, as a New Zealander because there were a lot of similarities, you know. So for me, coming in and seeing the, the tribalism in the, in, the, in, the, in the clubs, seeing uh, what goes on behind the scenes, off the field, the, the, there's a lot of, um, there's been a lot of um, probably infighting within Welsh rugby uh, over a number of years, um, you know, over money and, and bits and pieces, and, and all the clubs obviously want to do well. So there's been a lot of rivalry there, and you know, I think there's, been operating in silos quite a bit. So part of what I've been trying to do and, and having worked on the other side of the fence is to, is to build those relationships with the clubs and try to make it um, one big happy family. But um, we've got a wee way to go on that. It, you know, at the moment we've won a Six Nations, but we're nowhere near where we need to be to be consistent week in and week out at the top level. And, and I think we know that. Mm. Um, so it, it's a work in progress. Um, definitely a work in progress. Have you found, because one of the things we talked about last, last week's show about Eddie and, and the, Alex asked the exact question about why Wales have able to have some success with the limited, less numbers. And I said, one of the things that I find, especially in the UK, is not joined up thinking behind the clubs and that sometimes England would dictate or say, look, we'd like the players to do this stuff. They'd come to the clubs and the club S&C was going, you're not going to do this. The club coaches would say, you're not going to do this. Is that the kind of thing you're talking about in terms of... Um, you know, trying to, to, to manage the players better, try to build those relationships, try to get some central themes of play across, try to make sure that when you leave the Wales squad, you know, with all due respect to the regions, there isn't a huge dip in kind of intensity because the fact is that international level is different from the Premiership, it's different to, you know, the, uh, you know, the uh, sort pro of... Pro-14. Yeah, pro-14. <laughs> pro you have to help yeah, Hask we, with the, uh, the, inter the rugby itself. <laughs> Yeah, we, you know, that was one of the big learnings was how we came out of COVID at lockdown, um, how that impacted on the performances in the autumn. And then we looked at our numbers uh, coming into camp in this campaign, uh, and they were a lot better. You know, the clubs, uh, we've sat down, Bobby's gone through with the other S&C boys, uh, and I met, met with the coaches. And it's really making sure that um, we're all on the same page, as you say. And if we do that, it's going to help us immensely. Um, it would be nothing worse than having four different styles of play, um, you know, four different lots of uh, standards, I guess, in terms of S&C. So um, sharing all that information can only help us. Uh, and hopefully, well, we've got pretty much new coaches now in all the clubs. So they're, they're all pretty keen to do well. And so um, they've all been pretty receptive to, to conversations. Do you actually, do, do you look at someone like Eddie Jones, obviously managing England or um, Galtier in France and, and obviously see the, battles that sometimes go on with a with the union and would you see for either of them it benefiting it being the other way or is it just or would is it just something that they need to get on with because there is always questions about should England go central central contract should France go centrally contracted what's your opinions on it have you ever worked from the other way around well yeah just look at um we know what goes on in Ireland and, and, and you know New Zealand um Years ago, there'd be no sharing of information at all. Everyone just kept them themselves, and it was all about getting your own results, and it was dog-eat-dog, dog, really. But um, a number of decades ago, and, and this is where we're in catch-up mode in Wales, um, they were doing stuff decades ago that we're trying to implement now. So um, we are trying to catch up, and, and sharing of information and working together is, it sounds really, really simple, but you know it doesn't always happen. So, you know, we... we it will take time, but um, what we're trying to do is just pull our resources. One thing we do have, um, which is really, really helpful, is our geography. We're so close. 
I can be in a meeting in any of the clubs within 50 minutes, you know. So mm. that, is, that is a big help. You can get guys together, little mini groups and that sort of thing. So there are, the geography helps us. Um, centralised contracts, I mean, it's something that's been discussed here. Uh, at the moment, it's probably the area that we need to really sort out going forward. But uh, obviously, this pandemic has thrown everything into chaos um, financially for the clubs so uh, and for the union. So it's going to be interesting to see how we sort of come out of it in the next 12 to 24 months. Is there anything that since you took over, obviously with the experience of Scarlet's, that you just did not expect to be involved? Like some, I don't know, it was an odd tradition or something weird that you were like, oh my God, I can't believe Cuttons. this is happening. <laughs> Um, because I think the um, the Scarlet's boys probably bring some of that back from the international camp. So, you know, singing of songs, that sort of thing, um, little traditions when you come into the team for the first time, you know, th those things are important and they certainly love that side of it. Um, <laughs> unfortunately for me, I can't sing like the bloody Welsh boys can. <laughs> Most of them are fantastic singers, you know. Um, but yeah, those sorts of traditions and that, that probably go from one to the other. Did you have to get, did you have to get out of the front of the bus and sing? No. I didn't think, no. Oh, who bottled that? Ken again. <laughs> well, you know, that's why that's why you've named all those players. We'd have forced everyone. I don't think Eddie's actually sung, probably because yeah, maybe 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 the head coach is <laughs> exempt. Um, who would who would sing for your life in that Welsh squad? If you if you someone needed to nail an audition for for you to survive. Who would you who would you put your money on in that Welsh squad? Oh, it's a tough one because generally they all jump in and so they're all singing together. <laughs> you know, you just um, get a band. Yeah, yeah well, no, they, they're, 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 Choir. they're all, a lot of them are pretty good. You know, they. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to think. The the most confident person, and he wouldn't be the best singer, but he'd tell you that he is. Is Rob Evans? Rob Evans. Yes. So he doesn't lack in confidence, and um, <laughs> yeah, he would uh, he'd give anything a go. Right. Can you mime Sospen Vach or Ois Scarveretto or not? Um, lip syncing is, is, is what you've got to do, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just at, at just mumble and look confident. At, at the moment, though, we've got these masks on. so Very good. Yeah. Just hum. So in two years when it's all disappeared and you've still got your mask on, people are going, uh, he's really nervous about, <laughs> about COVID coming back. Your your autobiography, when the time comes, is going to be an extraordinary read. Um, you know, from from as we mentioned, the, the crime investigation unit through to Six Nations titles. I'd love to just very quickly get the headlines for you from coaching the police, coaching Auckland, and coaching Fiji as well. I mean, it, it's been an amazing journey. Were, were there bits on, along that journey that will live with you forever? Well, yeah, they're, they're all different, but um, they sort of all help you along the way and. Coaching Fiji was, uh, wow, it was, it was frustrating at times, but it was so challenging. Um, you probably all played with one or two Fijian boys, but when you've got a tour party of 36 players and, and Fijian management um, and your band Carver, it, 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 it really does test them, you know. <laughs> I'll give you a little example of what the discipline was like there. So we, we banned the Carver and... Uh, we had a, a board member turn up with something like 15 kilos of the stuff. Uh, how he got it there, I don't know, but this was on our, our tour. We played Wales, I think Portugal and Italy in about 2005, I think it was. But yeah, the, um, that, that was really interesting times coaching Fiji because I don't think there was a player in the squad that I didn't have to deal with for some off-field incident during my time there. Um, wow. It was really, really interesting. But what great guys, you know, and... Um, you know, did you just, did you have Rupeni at one? Did you have Rupeni at one stage? Yeah, yeah. Well, what, what a probably. The, did anyone ever have Rupeni? Yeah. <laughs> honestly, when he when he first started and came on the scene before the fame and 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 all the money and and um, all the alcohol and, and whatever whatever else he uh, he enjoyed doing, he 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 look he um he came onto the scene playing for Northland in in New Zealand and the Blues signed him up. And there was a preseason game where Wendell Saylor had just transferred from rugby league to uh, to rugby. So everybody came over to North Harbour Stadium. It was a preseason game, the Reds against the Blues. And they all came to see Wendell Saylor. And he was marking this little Fijian boy from Northland called Rapini Dowda. Um, Rapini scored four tries that day. Um, and he made, I'm just trying to think who the, the Aussie fullback was at the time, but they had a lot of... Latham. It would, it would, have, would it have been Latham? Yeah, it was. It was actually. <laughs> 
and um, he made those boys, um, yeah, look look pretty ordinary. Um, he was he was quick. He could he could go around you, go inside you. He, he well, he had everything. But um, yeah, it, it was just a shame if he was in any other country, eligible for any other country, he'd be a global superstar. Yeah. He would probably have been the best player on the planet in his day. Did wow. you ever, with the off-field incidents, do you ever forget yourself and go back to the old days, start getting the yellow pages out and stuff like tying into accounts? You know, <laughs> it's probably what's helped me with uh, a lot of the interviews actually. The <laughs> years because, uh, yeah, let's just say, let's just say, a few of the boys overstepped the mark from time to time. We've, had, we've been able to help them out. <laughs> <laughs> just, just protecting and I'm serving. Talking amateur, I'm talking about amateur club days, obviously in New Zealand now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, very good. Yeah, but, uh, Dor Dorian West used to always tell some great stories about things he used to do as a copper when people overstepped the market without without having to take them and give them the full lecture down the down the station. There was things they could do in, uh, just to let them know very quickly. Yeah, just just a knowing nod, but but yeah. nothing said. Yeah. Um, listen, Wayne, this has been really a very good of you to join join us and and be absolutely brilliant. I'm conscious of your time. What, what's on the to-do list now? You, a little bit, of, hopefully, a bit more celebration, but, um, you know, what, what else is there to get done in the next few days, weeks, months? Um, we've, got, we've got coaches reviews to get through um, to see if we hold our jobs. We've got uh, clauses in the contract sort of midway through to a World Cup, and so um, we'll be dealing with that um, probably this week. I think we've got some meetings tomorrow. Um, and then, yeah, there's some player contracts to, to get tidied up. Um, we've got a, a, a fantastic person in Julie Patterson who's done 30 years at the Union. She's um, head of uh, rugby operations. So we're just trying to tidy up a lot of loose ends before she goes. Um, and we've got a, a high performance, rugby high performance manager to, to uh, put in place. So those are the sorts of things between now and summer tour. Great. Neither of you two are putting your CVs in for that, by the way. We're going to keep those well and truly out of the intro. Congratulations. Many, many, many congratulations. It's been a brilliant story. We love stories that sort of a comeback variety. And from October, November to where you are now, it's just, it's brilliant to see. So thank you again for joining us. We wish you all the very best. Um, look after yourself, your team, and um, we shall follow with great interest. Hopefully we'll see a number of your team in action this summer in South Africa. I know, I know you'd love to see that as well. Thank you, Wayne. Look after yourself. All the very best. Thanks for having me on the show. And no doubt you'll edit out some of that stuff. We, we will look, we'll look after you. <laughs> we, we're, you not, we're not brave enough not to. I can tell yeah, you that yeah. for free. <laughs> okay, boys. Good on you. Thanks so much. Bye, bye, bye. <clears throat> How's it going, little, well, debrief on, little debrief on that? I mean, I, I'm... Okay, so I had no co concept of what he was going to be like, but it wasn't like that. What I think would be an unbelievable coach. I think, what a lovely guy. And I think um, I'd love to work with him. Do you know why? Because I think he... He embodies everything that I think is right in, in um, how you want to be coached. And obviously, I've never, yeah. you know, we, we came on the show and I remember, you know, I eat my words. I remember we, we were talking about under that pressure. And the one thing I said, I said, I don't know why, and I said, I don't know what's happening in the world. I said, the only thing you could look at is that it wasn't the international experience. Like, you know, I felt that maybe the experience would have to follow someone like one again. Everything I've, well, everything that I would say has completely changed my, my perspective of him. And I thought he was, I was brilliant, really interesting. And also, with all no due respect to Kiwis, you don't often get overly gregarious Kiwis, and he was brilliant. I thought what he said was 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 fantastic and really interesting. I literally, after ten minutes of listening to him, was like, I'd love to have played for him. He reminded, yeah. you know, he just uh, one thing that Hask would have picked up on is is relationships with players in terms of, you know, having those tough conversations, which a lot of coaches seem to forget about. They they don't give you reasons why you're dropped, or you know, the, the talk that he had with Byron Hayward, you know. I just think he's upfront, honest, and the over communication is is something that you always want out of a coach. Even if you're just picking up the phone, so you constantly know where you are, then you can you can adapt and change things and uh, constantly on we go. Um, so yeah, he was very impressive to be fair. Actually, uh, again, like Hass, didn't know how, how he was going to be, but someone I I saw. It's funny that how you think you meet someone and you would definitely want to play on the underneath them because. You can see yourself going in the same direction very easily. <laughs> I thought it was. Power I, thought it was I thought it was. I thought what I what I found interesting as well is that having read some management books and different stuff, we I talked about Stuart Lancaster uh, and the book that he used. To, you know, the score takes care of itself, and all these kind of different approaches. A lot of people come in and clean the whole the whole canvas, and then they start again. Immediately, you can tell he's he's intelligent, understands the social dynamics. You know, keeping those Welsh legends on board. 
you know, almost as a ring fence round of, I think it's really clever. All three of those guys are, are legends of Wales. All three of them are top lads. Like you're not going to find anyone from any country saying that those lads aren't, you know, Stephen Jones, one of the best coaches and players I work with, what an absolute hero, you know, Nugget, what, what, I can get, what, what, what a boy. But then also to see someone like Bobby on board, um, I actually quite jealous. That's the kind of environment that I want to I want to get involved with. <laughs> oh, sorry, my dog keeps letting himself into the room. Um, um, and I, you know, I, it, it, it's something that you want to play. And I think he's very astute and very smart. And I really enjoy it. And I think he's kind of um, he's got it nailed. And hopefully they can lead to some success. Because what I meant on that Lions tour was, I was so surprised when I saw the players how good they were. Because obviously we'd had the battles, but to watch how athletically good they were, how skillfully good they were. I think if we can harness that with a new style of play, because, you know, Warren and Sean were, were, were amazing, but, you know, you need to always evolve. And I think what they're trying to do with some evolution is good. And if they get the rub of the green and, and, and they can keep developing, he gets a chance to put his ideas in place, then I'm excited to see it. It's funny how they talk. He obviously talked about what New, New Zealand were and how Wales are sort of 20 years behind it and how they just share information. So everyone sort of plays the same way. And that's why you, is that why... New Zealand stay on top because they're just everyone's caught come through yeah. the same environment playing the same way so you're just pushing on the edges of or the boundaries of what you've been doing for 20 years it's an interesting thing comparing that to someone like England and France who each team only cares about their team they don't really necessarily care about the national team so it's not done for the greater good of every team playing the same sort of way so that anyone who steps into that international is at a, in a comfortable level it's it's an interesting food yeah. for thought. It's. I was just going to pick up on the thing you both saying about how much you'd love to play for him because I did the pro. I think it was a pro twelve when they won it in twenty seventeen. I think it was, and it was. I mean, a they played the most extraordinary rugby. So if Wales are on a journey now, and it's just beginning, I think there's a lot more to come from them as he begins to get his blueprint underway. But also. He was so, they, they just had so much fun. It looked like the most extraordinarily good time to be a, a part of that Scarlet's outfit. And you, you had some really sort of, um, you know, not straight down the line characters, but guys like Ken who love a, a blazer badge and a, and a tie combination pack. And then people like Rob Evans, Cubby, um, Jonathan Davis's brother as well, James Davis. I mean, completely the other, under the other end of the spectrum. And all of them just, it just looked an absolute riot. And it's really, there's something very romantic about when a riot turns successful, if you know what I mean. And um, I'm, I'm really pleased for him that he's come through and has quite obviously enjoyed and celebrated a Six Nations title. Good on him. I think it was you know, pretty interesting as well to hear. I know, you know you're never going to talk up the, the pressure, but I can imagine from what I've seen and when, it, you know, when I've, we stayed up in Wales and played the game, you see the media and the exposure, you know, the intensity is kind of like a, almost like a, not a diluted, but almost a, a sort of stronger strength than what we get in the, I know the UK press is by far and away in this kind of the England job is by far and away get hammered more, but with that intensity, that distilled intensity where, you know, Wales, rugby is a national sport, essentially, mm -hmm. you know, uh, for him to survive that and come out the other side of it and actually turn out for him to be a good <laughs> lad and to create the env environment. I, I like that even more because I wonder how close, and I, I know he said he got the relationship and they signed the contracts so and the board knew about it, but boards are all well and good. And this is what Michael Checker said when I interviewed him, that when 2015, he felt he had the support of the board. He had a good relationship. He could tell people how it was. It went, later on in 2019, he didn't. He lost the support of the board. They put other people in place. The board are only as good as what the pressure and media allow them to be before they f start folding and suddenly don't stop answering your calls. I wonder how <laughs> close it got, whether there was any pressure or, or was it as relaxed as he, he says it was? Because he doesn't seem like a man that gets phased, which is interesting because from the outside, I thought he was going to be absolutely phased to an inch of his life, you know? Yeah, yeah. But I suppose when you've worked homicide in Auckland, you know, oh, yeah, a couple yeah. of losses in, in an Autumn Nations Cup where no one's in the stadium doesn't necessarily work. I, I, our, our social team need to get on and mock up Hanson Pivak. I mean, it's, oh, it's Hanson Pivak. It sounds like a 1970s <laughs> show, doesn't it? In, in some sort of, what are they driving? They're going to be driving... Ford Capri. Ford Capri, do you think? Ford Capri, oh, leather, oh, leather what, jacket. What was, that, what was the car that you and Dylan had in? Oh, the V-Bang, a Vauxhall Victor. 
Is it, yeah, they're going to box that, that would work. That would I want work. a Mustang. I want something. There needs to be a little bit of attitude there. But they, oh. I, I want them rolling across the bonnet. There's I want big there's sideburns. There's no Mustangs in, in New Zealand. No, that's what I mean. You've, you've, got, got, you've got to reflect. You've got to reflect what's a larder. over there. Okay, so basically, <laughs> a handsome feedback in a larder, bad cop and bad cop. <laughs> Just rolling round, pee back with a little roll up on the side of his corner. <laughs> There's going to be such oh a good mock up. There's going to be such a good mock up photo. Oh, yeah, every Team social get to work. And Hanson's always got a chip stool with a chip before, the, before, <laughs> before the, um, the, cri the criminal runs past. And he's like, Steve, you're not going to get that? He's like, fucking, we'll get him next time. And you're just going to <laughs> That's what it'd be like, the comedy sketch. Oh, look what you've got and done. Wayne, you made me feel my fucking, made me feel my chip. <laughs> They'd, just, they'd have a massive suitcase uh, of tools on the back seat. Uh, you know, there'd be chainsaws and all sorts. We need to get the truth. Yeah. Um, yeah, Christ. I, I, someone needs to write a script. This yeah. needs to happen. Um, well done, Wayne Pivat. Well done, Wales. And to all those who've said we've been way too English recently, hopefully that settles the score. Yeah. Um, we just love good stories. I think that's what we're yeah. just trying to find. Always trying to find a good story. That certainly was one of those. That is it for GBNR this week. Thank you to Mike. Thank you, to James. Thank you, of course, to Wayne Pivat for dropping in. Uh, don't forget our sister show, The Good, The Scars and The Rugby with Emily Scar and Elmer Smith. Last week, we had the BBC commentator, Sarah Orchard. This week, previewing the Women's Six Nations, which kicks off this weekend. Good luck to the Red Roses. We'll be watching with great interest. Good luck to Scars in that as well. You can get that um, this week's show from wherever it is you do your YouTubing and your podcasting. Tins and I are back on Friday with our Premiership preview show. We didn't. How did we get on this week? I or, done by I, Bath. If, yeah, yeah. I'd have had a full yeah. house with uh, without Bath. Uh, well done, Gloucester. Actually, yeah. You well, changed horses mid-race. Well, I changed horses when I looked at the bookies and yeah. <laughs> proves that the bookies know what they're talking about. No surprise. Um, hopefully, we will get better and better. Not hard to. Uh, we've got a very special guest for you next week. It really will be the one club kicking legend club captain, country captain, and all-round inspiration that we trailed last week, but have popped to next week for obvious reasons. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. See you in seven days' time. Hit it, Rob Bryden. Look after yourselves. Be kind. Bye for now.